When you take a stop and look and see crazy things in this black history across the ocean and across the sea now is the time to be free hello and welcome to Africa a black me story part three uh, this is where we will be uh, continuing to dig down trying to get behind the real story of how we got from our original position of magnificence, uh, living naturally in a state of peace, love and relative prosperity, um, to our present position where, we, where even today we continue to struggle and strive for equal rights and justice in this modern world which seems unable to accept that the African black person could also be capable of achieving developmental greatness. Before we continue to go through our Black Me story, I'd just like to quickly recap what we discussed in part two. So, you can see highlighted in red, uh, the two sections uh, that we covered in part two. Uh, the first being uh, chapter five, where we looked at the first foreign contacts uh, relating to the earliest off-continent ventures by Africans as well as uh, to the first non-African visitors um, starting with Africans from the southeast of the continent who were traveling to Madagascar at least from the middle of the 9th millennium BCE and though I didn't touch on it in part two there is, uh, there is a strong possibility that they may also have started to use this location as a stopping off point on their way to the eastern coast of Asia. Uh, later, uh, they would go on combined voyages of um, going to Australia and Pacific. That's combined with uh, their eastern Asian friends and uh, they would um, make land in Australia and across the Pacific. Okay, so further north, Africans from Pont, the third major East African empire, uh, had begun building big ships and sailing across the Red Sea into Arabia and the Near East from the third millennium BCE. Their smooth trading relationships with the Canaanites will have been influential in their migration into the near, into the northeast Egypt region during the second millennium BC uh, after famine set in in their homeland, making them the first non-African settlement on African territory. On the west coast of the continent, we talked about how Africans sailed across the Ethiopian Ocean to make it all the way. Uh, to Mexico, building the Mayan Olmec head statues in the mid second millennium BCE. We also touched on various aspects of contact uh, made on the North African coast, which we went further in depth uh, on in the sixth chapter, which was the North Africa first millennium BCE. Uh, we talked about how the whole of the North African coast fell gradually into the hands of foreigners, starting with the Phoenicians who traveled in, uh, who arrived in Tunisia towards the start of the first millennium uh, BCE and built Carthage there, as well as developing trading posts along the whole of the North African Mediterranean coast, going west towards Morocco. The Kush Empire would establish a trade route through the Sahara uh, which would become well used in the centuries to come, enabling their ability to trade with the Carthaginians at their base in Morocco, avoiding interference from the Egyptians. Over the following centuries, various other invaders and colonizers would arrive uh, in the North Africa region, including the Greek, 
Assyrians, Persians, and finally the Romans, who by the end of the first millennium BC had taken control over the whole of the North African coast. Before we get into our next chapter on independent Africa up to the uh, first millennium of the common era, I would just like to uh, expand a little bit on what we were talking about towards the end of part two. This is in relation to the uh, celestial sphere, uh, which according to the Phoenician and Greek philosophers of those early times was invented by an old king in the uh, Atlas Mountains region of Northwest Africa. This king, who they named Atlas, was supposed to have lived around 600 BCE, which would uh, position him as a partner in the slave trading activities of the Carthaginians on Morocco's north coast during this period. Africans studying of the stars started a lot earlier, which is evident when you take into consideration the way that the Africans had started to emerge from out of their nomadic lifestyle practices, where they had relied on the migratory instincts of the wild cattle in their locations for a sense of security away from the dangerous predators that may come sniffing during the lean season before the spring equinox. Um, they had started adopting more settled practices within fortified surroundings strongly influenced by their studies of the heavenly bodies. They came to the realization that the cattle and other such animals began their migrations in one direction or the other at an appointed time according to the shifting positions of the 13 prominent constellations in the sky. So as you can see on this illustration, uh, we have 13, uh, you'll recognize what I've called here the star fields uh, as star signs um, of which if uh, you're into your astrology, is, uh, there are 12. Uh, here we have 13. Uh, there are actually 13 constellations uh, that can be seen from, this, uh, from the uh, locations close to the equator. So um, in the whole, there are 13. But Ephesus, which is the fourth one on this uh, table, uh, cannot be seen from the Northern Hemisphere which is the reason why uh, we will have 12 uh, months in a year rather than 13 in the Western calendar. Uh, they learnt, the ancient Africans learnt that the sun would shine from a northerly, uh, from a southerly position in the sky between, uh, if we look on here, Libra and uh, Aquarius and from a more northerly position between Aries and Leo. Uh, the bits that are marked in red, the columns that are marked in red, Virgo and Pisces, these are um, the times of the equinox. So uh, at number one, uh, you would have the autumn equinox uh, where the sun is more or less the shadow cast uh, at this time is more or less straight whereas um, during the seasons the winter season or the southerly and the northerly seasons um, the shadow casts to one side or the other so during the equinox uh, the autumn equinox at number one and the spring equinox at number eight um, the shadow cast would be uh, more or less straight down to the ground okay in gaining this knowledge, they had truly risen, as it would be later written in the Bible, up from the ways of the prey to crouch down like a humble lion, gaining a knowledge that had previously been reserved for the gods alone, and in doing so, conquering nature to become lion tamers. Evidence of early African studies into the stars is shown in the way the three great pyramids of Giza, 
which were built in the middle of the 3rd millennium BC, are aligned with the three stars referred to uh, in Greek mythology as Orion's Belt. The constellation from which this belt formed part of would be deified in ancient Greek culture as the hunter and in ancient Babylon as the shepherd, visible as a minor spectacle in the night sky during the uh, common migratory season prior to the spring equinox. In the ancient Egyptian culture, the god figure represented in the Orion constellation was Osor, the god uh, of all the dead ancestors in heaven, who I would prefer to call the Lion Tamer. Further studying of the various heavenly bodies would allow them to break down the reliable and regular sequence of the stars into 365 recordable daily chunks. The first step in being able to break the year down into minute recordable chunks came through their observation of the moon which has four phases that could be accurately broken down into groups of seven. So if we look at this um, diagram here, what we have is we have the four phases. You can see the four phases. If we read it from uh, right to left, uh, you have the, the new moon, uh, followed by seven days later, or just seven and a half days later, you have the waxing moon, which is like the half half moon um, with with the moon is starting to uh, gain a shade. Okay. And then the full moon, where it is bright, um, bright shining, fully uh, illuminated. And then the waning moon for the fourth week of the month, um, which is where the where you start to see the the, the shine, uh, as you would say, waning, going away, uh, until we get the the next new moon. Okay, so if you're good at maths, you can work out that seven days make up a week, four weeks make up twenty eight days, which we could call a month and which was kind of um, being used as a marker as a month. If you notice that the word month actually relates to the word moon. Okay, so it's, um, that is where you get the identification uh, with a month. So, but if you're really good at maths, I've got a table here. Um, if you're really good at maths, um, you'd be able to work out that 28 days when multiplied by 13, uh, which is the number of identified constellations in a year cycle, as we've already spoken about, uh, then you get the answer 364. So as you can see here, um, I've just broken down this mathematical table and uh, this is a time table that's going right up to 28 and um, we've just broken it down to 28 and you can see across the bottom we've got 13 columns yeah so 13 times 28 is 364 yeah and that uh, would give you 12 months of 28 days and then the 13th month uh, we can add an additional day to that to make 29, to make the full 365 days. And um, over the over a fourth year period, the principle of the leap year, um, you would add an, an additional uh, day to make that up to 30 days. Okay. The individual weekly lunar phases were closer to seven and a half days, as I just said, uh, than the round figure of seven days that was used. Uh, again, we're talking about simplifying 
uh, the recording process okay as was shown on the ancient greco roman celestial sphere diagram the seven days of the week were named after seven planets that stand within the solar system and were distinguishable from the uh, distant stars that stand in their identifiable star field constellations starting off with the moon day or monday which uh, through its varying phases passing through both day and night stands as a reliable marker for the beginning of each week the next two planets are those that are recognized as being closer to the sun than the earth effectively making them moons of the sun these are Mercury and Venus, still referred to in the French language as Mercredi, which is a Wednesday, and Vendredi, which is a Friday. But as you will notice, the days are being jumbled up since uh, the model uh, that we have been looking at here was created. So if you look, uh, the first three days of the week, uh, starting from one day, so, uh, which is a moon, uh, the second day, Tuesday, is Mercury. And the third day is Wednesday, Venus. Okay. Both of these uh, planets will appear in close proximity to the sun, either just before daybreak or just after, after sunset, sorry. Just after sunset. Uh, Mercury appears three or four times throughout the year, while Venus would only pop up for an extended period across two or three consecutive star field constellations uh, within every 18 months, making it possible to identify Mercury as being the closest planet to the sun. The next planet on the list was the Solace or Sun, um, which obviously we would call Sunday. Uh, just like the soul that was within every living body radiating positive energy and life wherever it resides the solace is embedded securely at the midpoint of the week which uh, shows that the ancients were not only aware of these planets but also knew their positions in relation to the sun so the final three planets uh, are marking the beginning uh, of the modern weekend uh, are further away from the sun than the earth and uh, behave more like the distant stars than the first three planets uh, which we have already talked about. The first of these was named after Mars, the red star, referred to as Mardi, uh, which is uh, Tuesday in French. Okay. Uh, Mars only appears in the night sky every other, week, every other year but will be visible across consecutive star fields over a two to three month period when seen. Its non-appearance in every other annual uh, cycle is confirmation that it moves around under the 13 constellations but at a slower pace because of its greater distance from the Sun. The final two planets on the list, Jupiter and Saturn, are almost indistinguishable from the distant stars in their various constellations without studying them closely over a period that can stretch in some circumstances as long as four years. The next day in the list is Jupiter Day, which is aligned with Jeudi, which is Thursday in French. Uh, it can be seen once a year after approximately one year and one month, having moved around in the night sky by just a single star field constellation during this time. The seventh and final day of the week is uh, named after the most distant planet from the sun in, the li in this list, uh, which is Saturn, aligned with the name for Saturday. This planet behaves the most like a distant star 
been seen under the same Starfield constellation for two or three years in a row before moving into the next adjoining Starfield. Plotting out the planets and stars in this way allowed them to make uh, plans according to specific days. Independent Africa, up to the year 1000 CE. By 200,000 BCE, it is known that there were modern human beings spread around the whole of the continent in various pockets of territory hidden deep within the security of the vast forests. From north to south, east to west, and in Central Africa, signs of this early presence has been found. Now before I get into um, going down into the details of uh, independent Africa, uh, I want you to remember, as we pointed out right at the beginning of this series in part one, that uh, the research that we have done uh, is focused around the uh, 32 countries that were the original members of the OAU. So um, unfortunately the research doesn't cover uh, much of South, most of South Af Southern Africa, uh, but we have added into the research um, countries uh, such as Angola, South Africa, and Kenya, just to make uh, this research a little bit more firm and solid. Okay. So during this uh, early period, around 200,000 years ago uh, onwards, uh, some of the now extinct uh, African Homo erectus beings were still around in various regions, and it is likely that they pose a serious threat to any humans that they came across, uh, considering them to be a source of food. The first recorded evidence of significant human migration indicates that there was an occurrence around 40,000 BCE with people moving from what is now Botswana into southern Angola. It is very possible that this was connected to the presence of Homo erectus clans. This would have been a significant step in the development of human intelligence as they uh, successfully adopted a strategy of avoidance that would frustrate their greatest adversary and reduce uh, this variety of hominin beasts down into cannibalistic behaviors. Uh, new avoidance strategies were also being introduced in Southeast Africa and towards the east of the continent within the territory of modern day DR Congo. In both cases, the women of the community had begun making tally sticks from the fibula bone of a baboon. These sticks had several marks grooved into them, being ordered into non-random numerical groups with a strong indication that they were being used to measure the distance between the menstrual cycles of all the adult females. This was important because the accompanying faint scent of rich blood, though not necessarily noticeable to humans, when carried on the wind may have had the effect of exposing the human dwelling sites to the attentions of any remaining Homo erectus beings that might have been in the area. For reasons of security, each woman would know when it was their sacred time for ritual bathing and anointing with perfumed oils by keeping ahead of the various lunar phases that are repeated every 29 or 30 day cycles um, in line with their personal bodily functions. By doing this, the Homo erectus threat could be dispelled. 
Volcanic activity in DR Congo around 20,000 BCE would cause the community there to disperse and the use of the baboon-born talistic instruments also died out as a consciousness and understanding of the lunar phases in its cycles and other celestial bodies was being developed. Further out on the east coast, uh, this early period also saw people located in modern day Tanzania, making the short distance across the sea to the offshore island of Zanzibar, possibly using an early uh, variation of the outrigger style long canoes. Although there is no evidence of human settlements at this early stage, it is speculated that the uh, island, just 16 miles away, was being used as a short stay location associated with the collection of food and other resources. Coming into the 10th millennium BC, the first settlements with agricultural farming pottery making and fishing were being established in several non-connected regions in both East and West Africa. This appears to be a minority lifestyle choice at this time, uh, meeting steep competition from the nomadism that was becoming popular in the Sahara region and the long practiced forest existence being followed in much of the rest of the continent. By the 8th millennium BC, Further settlements had been developed in the northeast of the continent, spreading up from the eastern locations as two clear opposing camps began to emerge, beginning uh, between the sedentary settlers and the, and the migratory centered nomads. In Egypt, the settled people there asserted their position in relation to this through the creation of an engraved image in the form of their chosen deity. Which, as you can see here, was the lion, a uh, symbol of independence, bravery, and strength. This, of course, is known today as the Great Sphinx of Giza. Probably influenced by this, a community of nomads in the Sahara region migrated south and settled in the modern day territory of Central African Republic. Africans from the southeast of the continent had started making settlements in the offshore island of Madagascar, making the journey in boats that were sufficiently sophisticated in design to successfully make the journey repeatedly. Further north in the Chad Basin region, a fishing community had developed along the Yob River following from Nigeria into Lake Chad. They were building large canoe type boats to support their fishing activities and transportation of goods and resources along the river for uh, at, at least from the 7th millennium BCE. By the 4th millennium BCE, further settlements based around farming practices were emerging deeper into parts of West Africa. In the east, three major settlements had been established, including ancient Egypt, where the dynastic system had been introduced. This involved a significant trade in relationship with the other two major settlements, which were the kingdoms of Kush and Punt. The kingdom of Punt's trading power was enhanced by the fact that they were, by this time, trusted trading partners with the Arabians, who were located just a short distance across the Red Sea. The next millennium would see the construction of the Great Pyramids in Egypt and other great uh, monuments in Kush, developed in line with the spiritual ideologies and civil practices that were being exercised in the uh, secure city dwellings. This loose-fitting set of ideologies was spread, reaching southeast Nigeria, where a series of step pyramid structures were also built. The second millennium BC would see the first major conflict between two African states, when friction between Egypt and Kush saw Egypt invade into their territory, keeping uh, large portions of it under Egyptian rule, 
for several centuries. Iron smelting practices were being introduced in West Africa from modern day Nigeria and Cameroon and up uh, to the upper river Volta region, which is modern day Burkina Faso, probably tying in with uh, migratory activity from out of the kingdom of Kush at this time. Uh, and probably included uh, a planned future recruitment to support the Kushite struggle against its e Egyptian oppressor. This marriage of East and West cultures would see further movement, this time for the purpose of cultural exchange. This would be described in certain scholarly circles as being a part of the Bantu expansion, uh, this wave stretching across into Central Africa. The level of cultural exchange taking place across the East and Central and West Africa, even stretching towards some of the Southern territories, forged a sense of harmony across several tribes and nations that would provide added strength to the Kushites eventual revenge on ancient Egypt in the 8th century BCE. It is intended, it is attested to, that the ancient Egyptians had already gone through various stages where they had strayed from the divine culture that had been created, taking on various divide, uh, diverse misconceptions of the old spiritual concepts, even resorting to the looting of temples and graves, particularly during its previous times of foreign rule from the Hyksos. The Kushite invasion into southern Egypt was their opportunity to see these principles reinstated, but failed attempts to invade into the Asian Near East Canaan t uh, territory would bring a reaction from the Assyrian Empire, who would be successful in driving the Kushites out of Egypt altogether in the middle of the 7th century BCE. The following century would see the Kushites go on to carve out a trade route across the Sahara towards the Moroccan Mediterranean coast. From there, they dealt with the Carthaginians in gold and ivory. They also brought with them slaves who were basically people captured from the less advanced, that is to say, being less equipped to do battle communities uh, that they came across during their long journey having already in past times familiarised themselves with the foreigners' wanton need of slave labour. Activity on the Trans-Saharan trade routes along Persia's, alongside Persia's invasion into Egypt towards the end of the 6th century BCE would coincide with a further wave in the so-called Bantu expansion, reaching into the modern-day territory of DR Congo and steadily moving south, reaching deep into southern Africa by the 4th century BCE. By the end of the century, Egypt had uh, transferred over into the hands of ancient Greek under the infamous ruler Alexander. At the beginning of the 1st century BCE in the east, the kingdom of Aksum would be established having influence in most of the territory of the now broken up Kingdom of Punt, uh, including territory in Arabia. About 300 years later, the first great nation settlement on the west would be established, that being the ancient Ghana Empire who were profiting greatly from the evolving trading activity on the trade routes that passed through the territory they controlled. Its growth was supported by the introduction of camels for the transportation of goods through the desert. The Arabians re revolted around the beginning of the 4th century CE against rule in the territory from Aksum. That's rule in their territory from Aksum. This would force the East African Kingdom uh, to significantly reduce their influence in the region. During later decades, uh, the ruler in Aksum, King Ezana, 
converted to the Christian faith, having been persuaded to do so by his childhood teacher, a former slave in the royal court called Frumentius. Rome had already become a major force across the north coast of Africa, uh, des desperately trying to keep its growing Christian community under control. Its harsh treatment towards the Mori in the northwest of the continent saw a sudden migration south into their neighboring territories where they had previously farmed in search of stock for the Carthaginian slave markets. Um, the reaction from the people they encountered in modern day Mauritania was to themselves migrate further south towards the Senegal River. At the beginning of the fifth century CE, uh, Axum's desire to create its own Christian legacy brought about its invasion and the subsequent fall of the Kingdom of Kush, believing that there would be significant loot to be gained from the treasures presumed to have been smuggled out of ancient Egyptian temples in days gone by. The Kingdom of Axum's slow decline began at the beginning of the 7th century CE when it lost its hold on its remaining Arabian territories a matter of decades before the emergence of the Islamic uh, faith there. Going into the 8th century CE, the Arabs had already arrived on African soil with their newly established religion from modern day Somalia and Djibouti. Their attempts to go further inland into, t into the territory they called Sudan would be repelled, forcing them into a, into a treaty of non-aggression and a rapid increase in trade traffic along the Trans-Saharan routes as a result. The growth in slave raiding activity to service the Arab markets drove up the number of migratory movements going on in Western Africa, more significantly into the Senegal region. The following century would see the emergence of several larger scale kingdoms that would spread across the continent in the west, central, and southern Africa, with more to follow in the next few centuries while others crumbled. Waves of migration would continue to occur in West Africa right up to the end of the first millennium CE influenced by slave raiding activity for the Arab trade markets, taking some groups into formerly uninhabited regions. The empires that were turning out to be the most strong and successful were the ones that had the best route through into the Arab trade markets for natural resources and slaves, which would contribute to the breeding of strong feelings of antagonism and mistrust between the neighboring kingdoms and civilizations in Africa. Christianity, first millennium of the common era. By the start of the first millennium CE, there were many people of both the Jewish and Samaritan cultures throughout the Roman Empire, including inside its territories in North Africa. They were usually made up from peasant migrants escaped, who escaped the violence taking place in their homeland of Palestine, or they were slaves or, or uh, for, former slaves who had originated from that place. In Egypt and uh, Libya, where the Ptolemaic Greeks were uh, previously being in power, many of the people there were also uh, following a religious practice that had been originally encouraged by their former Greek rulers. The intention 
in its forming had been to pacify the people and to make them uh, submit to Greek rule. This strategy was followed by bringing the characteristics of two opposing deities together into a single deity, whilst giving it the outward appearance of the Ptolemaic ruler of the day, which they called Serapis. This name came from a merger of um, the god Asor, which is uh, the ultimate ancestor and father figure, brave and strong like a lion, uh, and also Apis, the god Apis, the guiding spirit of righteousness, gentle as a calf or a lamb. These two deities were brought together in the personality of the Greek ruler, the successor to Alexander the Greek in Egypt, Ptolemy Sota, Sota meaning saviour or deliverer. He chose this name because he wanted the people to acknowledge him as their anointed saviour, indeed as the Greek would say, their Christos or Christ. By 50 CE, the new faith of Christianity had arrived in the territory, probably as a compromise movement to unify the oppressed classes of people under the system of Roman rule. In most of the uh, available texts from those days, the Greek or Roman writers seem unable to differentiate between any of the numerous religious cultures of the farmer, peasant and slave classes. The Roman Emperor Hadrian displays his faults towards them in a letter he wrote in 134 of the Common Era, as quoted here. This mixed community of the wrestlers, who the Romans branded collectively as Jews, rose in rebellion against the Romans' rule in Cyrenaica in 115 of the Common Era. The unrest would spread into Egypt a year later, as well as into nearby off-continent locations such as Cyprus and, Ju and Judea. This revolt was led by a rebel called Lucuas, who the Romans presumed to be another self-proclaimed king of the Jews, and uh, which resulted in the destruction of many of the Greek or Roman temples and monuments across Cyrenaica. Its battle against the Romans would see the city virtually flattened and depopulated by its end. The Christian faith would continue to spread across the rest of the north of the coast of Africa during the 3rd century of the Common Era amongst the slaves, farmers and peasants in those territories. They would face routine persecution from the Roman authorities right through until 313 of the Common Era when the Emperor Constantine passed a law in favour of tolerance for those of the Christian faith. Three years later, a ship on a voyage from the Roman territory of Tyre in modern-day Lebanon, going to Ethiopia, had the misfortune of insulting the locals at the Aksumite port where they had docked. This resulted in the slaughter of the whole crew, except for two boys who had been on the ship serving as apprentices to their now-dead mentor. They were spared and handed over to the King of Axum, who appointed them as slaves in the royal court. His fondness for them would see them elevated to positions of importance within his court, and he would grant them their freedom on his deathbed. 
they decided to stay on to look after the education of the young prince and heir to the throne and use that opportunity to spread their Christian faith amongst the people that they were in contact with. After the prince came of age, the two brothers left the country, but eager for missionary work to continue um, through Mentius, uh, one of the brothers stepped off, stopped off in Egypt where he, he, um, where he was consecrated as a bishop before uh, returning to Exxon and baptizing his former pupil. Um, King Exana in 328 of the common era. Within a couple of years, Rome had become officially a Christian state, seeing it become the most dominant faith across the whole of North Africa. In Libya, Rome's change of attitude towards the faith had caused a split between the traditionalists, whose religious principles demanded a strong anti-state -stan anti stance and the more recently converted who tended to be from the wealthier classes and functioned more willingly under the authority of the state leaders. Christianized Rome uh, would continue to rule on the north coast of the continent in various guises for over 300 years. Facing agitation on their easternmost borders from Mesopotamia in the 7th century of the Common Era, the Byzantine Empire sought an alliance with Nubia to support them in their present conflict. In the process, they were also successful in converting the people there uh, to the Christian faith. The Byzantine Empire would soon begin to lose much of its eastern and north African territories to Arab uh, control and conversion to the Muslim faith early in the 8th century CE. Going into the second millennium of the Common Era, only Ethiopia and Sudan had uh, significant Christian communities with little pockets of Christianity in the former Roman territories on the north coast. In this black history, across the ocean and across the seas, now is the time to be free. No commotion, I'm feeling the pain, I feel their emotion, the love and devotion, just like a root potion, cause I'm a rebel. 